darkness, March 8th, 1862, was really a dark time for the Union. Two major warships had been destroyed by this monster called a half-submerged crocodile intent on evil that seemed unstoppable. An eerie glow glanced and glimmered across Hampton Roads that evening from the burning Congress. And yet into the harbor that night will come perhaps one of the most unusual warships ever seen to that date, the USS Monitor. Well, I have to tell you, uh, the Monitor uh, is a godsend, even though, you know, I have to tell you that uh, because we had a telegraph line that went from Newport News Point, the coal piers, to Fort Monroe, then under the bay to Cape Charles, then up the eastern shore, crossing at Annapolis, that telegraph line then went to D.C. So within hours of the attack, they knew all about what had happened in Hampton Roads and the entire cabinet, Lincoln's cabinet, were depressed. In fact, he has an emergency meeting and talking, what are we going to do? Well, the big thing is, is that uh, Edwin Stanton, Secretary of War, is nervous. He is looking out the drapes of the windows of the White House, thinking he's going to see the Merrimack at any time appear, right? Gideon Wells says, oh, have no fear. We have an ironclad on the way there. Edwin Stanton, with great excitement, will say, what is it? Tell me how many guns does it have? He says, well, it is the Monitor, and it has two guns. And Edwin Stanton says, oh, we are lost. We are lost. We are lost. Because back in those days, if you had 10 guns versus two, who's going to win? 10 guns. So and this is also an unseekable super weapon that the Confederates have. The fear that it may strike New York or Washington were very real in the minds of those politicians. However, I'm going to tell you right now, the CSS Virginia, Merrimack, would have never made it. Uh, it is um, <clears throat> basically has a very sheer hull, compro-quitted with 790 tons of iron plate on top. So on March 8th, it was a perfect day. Not a cloud in the sky, not a ripple in Hampton Roads. And the next day was just the same. Well, I have to tell you, uh, this story really all begins when the Federals learn about the, actually, the creation of or the transformation of the Merrimack into the Virginia. As news, now I got to tell you, there is no uh, uh, security, intelligence and sh uh, security back in those days. Um, actually, Confederate Southern newspapers like the Lynchburg, Virginia has a big headline. We have captured Gosport Navy Yard. We have enough iron to build 10 ironclads. Hello in the North. Because Stephen Russell Mallory, Confederate Secretary of the Navy, has now figured out that if I can build iron ships, I can sink the entire U.S. Navy because they have none. Well, the Federals, you know, when they see this in the newspaper and everything like that, um, and I have to tell you, it worked both ways. Uh, the greatest thing during the battle between these two ironclads is that the Confederates, i.e. Catesby App Roger Jones, acting commander of the Virginia, he actually has a copy of the Scientific American magazine from February of 1862, which had what in it? The plans of the Virginia. There you go. So, I mean, the monitor. So, you know, it's like, ah, we know what that is, but now how to defeat it. So anyway, the uh, North sets up what is called an ironclad board made up of Hiram Paulding, uh, Joseph Smith, and Charles Henry Davis, all older U.S. Navy officers. And they select from 16 designs. 
one of those designs was a rubber ironclad, believe it or not. They said, oh, the shells are going to bounce off of it. Well, then someone said, well, you know, they explode. <laughs> you know? And so that, that doesn't pass the test. They will select, of course, the uh, USS New Ironsides, which is going to be built at American Sons in Chester, Pennsylvania. However, they pick another one. And this is the design submitted by Cornelius Vanderbilt, the designs made by Samuel Pook of the Pook, Pook Turtle fame. And this ship is going to be built in Mystic, Connecticut. However, it is a tumble home design. And Charles Henry Davis says, well, are you sure this thing is going to be stable enough? And Bushnell, Cornelius Bushnell's an industrialist a Republican insider. One of his best friends is a guy known as Gideon Wells. So surely he's going to get this contract. Um, and uh, so what's going to happen is that uh, Bushnell says, well, I don't know whether it's stable or not. Let me go find out. That brings him to John Erickson. Erickson says, yeah, 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 it's stable. However, I got something to show you. And he goes into a closet and brings out a cardboard model of what we call the monitor and Gadzooks uh, Cornelius Van uh, Cornelius Bushnell says this this will save the nation and uh, he says well the U.S. Navy doesn't like me and Erickson of course was connected with the disaster on the USS Princeton on February 29 1844 and so that's when a gun blew up. It wasn't a gun of Erickson's design, but nevertheless, he got blamed for it. So he shows this model. Bushnell says, well, look, I'm going to take it down to the ironclad board. You're going to get a contract. He immediately sends a little note to Gideon Wells. Look, I'm coming. Can I go see Abe Lincoln? And Gideon Wells says, sure. So they go over, talk to Lincoln, shows the model. And then he goes to the ironclad board. He brings it and sets it on the table. Everybody goes, what is that? Lincoln walks in the room, looks at it, says, you know, it kind of reminds me of a country girl when she first puts her foot in a silk stocking and exclaims, there's really something in it. Oh, my gosh. Lincoln's saying that. These guys on Ironclad Board said, oh, we hate the model because it's made by John Erickson. We really don't think much of Abe. And so, but they've got his interests. Well, Cornelius Bushnell cannot answer any questions. So um, Bushnell goes up and has Erickson, John Erickson, Swedish-American inventor, to come down um, from New York and to meet with the Ironclad Board. When he walks in, they says, what are you doing here? We hate you. We hate your model. <laughs> and Erickson, who's quite an egotist, will say, you know, um, I don't care what you think about me, but this little vessel is something that's going to save the nation. And he ex describes everything it can do. They all said, okay, um, we'll build it. And uh, um, so uh, they place it, of course, into Continental Iron Works. That's where they build the keel. There's over 40 different vendors. So when you think about interchangeable parts, that's exactly what the monitor has. Uh, the turd is made over in Staten Island. The iron plate is made in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, the list goes on. And in fact, when they put the turd together in Staten Island, they say, oh my gosh, you know, we can't pick it up to take it over to Greenpoint. So they have to take it back apart, put it back together, and slowly this new thing starts to take shape. And uh, uh, so it's supposed to be built in 100 days. And I got to tell you, Erickson has some partners to do this project. It's $275,000, uh, including uh, uh, John Rowland, uh, uh, John Winslow, later, well, a congressman. You know, um, I have a new book coming out in November about uh, John Worden, the commander of the Monitor, and the graft involved with naval construction during Civil War will amaze everyone. And uh, yeah, I'm not going to make any comparisons. Uh, so anyway, uh, 
Uh, this man uh, will be named commander of the Monitor. He is John Lomer Worden. He is a uh, 24-year veteran of the U.S. Navy. Uh, he is uh, very thin. He just got out of being a POW in November. He was the first POW of the Civil War. I'm giving a lecture about that, I think, sometime soon. Um, but yes, and, and he is a, called a scientific officer because he worked on gunnery. He also worked on the Naval Observatory with Matthew Fontaine Mari. So this guy is a rising star in the U.S. Navy, one to be trusted. And actually, uh, Joseph Smith says, I think when he sends the letter to Worden to take command of the monitors, I think you're the right sort of officer to be in command of her. And so Worden accepts the assignment. You can well imagine I have a newfangled ship that has 40 different patented inventions, right, on board. Uh, I'll tell you, the crew members, you're living below the waterline, which is unbelievable, untold before in naval warfare. And uh, basically, they, they even have to deal with um, a compression water closet which should have started my story with that joke, but uh, uh, the, the big, big thing is they all go, what is this? And so Dr. Daniel Long, who's the uh, assistant surgeon on board the monitor, uh, will say, well, you know, it's, it's a water closet because most of these guys are rubes or foreigners and they've never seen anything like this before. So he goes in to use it to test it, excuse me, and he hits the switches wrong and he gets blown off of it okay <laughs> and so welcome to the high-tech navy and that's what the monitor was it had an 18 inch freeboard virtually a wash with the sea and its biggest thing was its revolving turret and that revolving turret uh contained two 11 inch dahlgren shell guns which are some of the most powerful guns in the U.S. Navy inventory at the time. I get thirsty when I think about being living underneath the waterline. <laughs> that William Keel is going to say, I was sitting in my snuggery, which is his little cabin, and they had deck lights that brought in sunlight into the their rooms. And so he's there reading and all of a sudden it goes dark and he looks up and he sees fish going over his lights. And so that's how unusual this ship happens to be. It has tons of flaws. And in fact, the biggest flaw was it was unseaworthy. And of course, the monitor um, left New York on 6 January. 1862 the ship uh, basically was towed by a powerful steamer known as the Seth Lowe uh, and uh, because this ship did not produce enough power to manage a seaway it only went seven knots and that just doesn't work at sea uh, at least for me um, and, uh, and everyone else on the monitor well after it passes uh, the shore, uh, going down along the shore of New Jersey, it will strike a terrible storm where the ship will be thrown about. So much water comes on board. They have to have bucket brigades. They man the pumps. But the water rises so much in the engine room that it actually causes the fires to go out. Noxious gases fill the ship. It looks like it's doomed, but somehow they get the pumps back working and they're able to get the ship uh, back into service. It will almost sink again when going over a shoal off of Chink Chincoteague, Virginia. So the ship almost sinks twice. The first time, Worden is so seasick that actually Samuel Dana Green, uh, whoopsie. He's here somewhere. Um, uh, Samuel Dana Green will take command of the vessel and stabilize the crew. Of course, this ship 
was meant to get to Hampton Roads before the emergence of the Virginia. Uh, you know, actually, the Confederates know it's coming. Um, on um, March 6, 1862, the New York Times has a column that lists all sailings leaving the harbor. And guess what's on there? USS Monitor. Okay, so they knew it was coming. There's no secrets. And so Worden brings his ship through the capes at about five in the afternoon and out in front of him. He can see the gun explosions, the fires, the sound, the booming cannons echoing across the water. So as soon as he arrives, he takes his ship next to uh, the USS Roanoke. The Roanoke is commanded by John Marston, who is in command of the squadron in Hampton Roads, or the station, as we would say. So Marston says, oh my gosh, I've got orders to Washington to send you to Washington, but I know the greatest defense of Washington is right here in Hampton Roads. And so I want you to go and protect the Minnesota. The Minnesota is a 47-gun steam screw frigate that uh, basically sister ship to the Merrimack. And uh, she uh, had run aground uh, during the March 8th engagement so badly that they can't get her off. So she's doomed. Actually, she's already been struck by gunfire by the CSS Virginia. And uh, as a result of that, um, she will... Uh, uh, has suffered some fires and some other damage. Uh, but the big thing is, is that uh, she's there and she's a target for the Virginia. On the morning of March 9th, the crew of the Virginia go to their guns at six in the morning. They want to hit Hampton Roads at high tide so they can destroy the Minnesota and wreak havoc with the rest of the wooden ships in Hampton Roads. So they go to their guns. William Klein will write, uh, we had a breakfast of two boiled eggs and two jiggers of whiskey. And uh, uh, ever since I read that, I've been doing that. So, uh, <laughs> so if I forget something during my lecture, I apologize. Sir, but sir how, how much is a jigger? A jigger is um, about two ounces, you know. So it's a hearty breakfast, you know. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so anyway, uh, so basically the Virginia comes into Hampton Roads. Uh, you can see, whoa. oh, no, that one. So here's where the Virginia is at night along Sewell's Point. It will come in and head straight towards the Minnesota, which you can see to the left. And the Minnesota, of course, is stuck. It has a steam tug next to it trying to pull it off, the USS Dragon. And the Virginia will slowly approach. And then they see next to the uh, uh, Minnesota what looks like a barge, which they think, oh, that's fine. They're trying to take stuff off. But instead, that little barge pulls away from the Minnesota. Now, I got to tell you, the commander of the Minnesota just on Jacques Henry Van Brunt, he is actually, uh, you know, of the old sink before surrender concept. Uh, actually, when Worden shows up, says, you know, meets him. And of course, the monitor is about nine and a half feet off the water edge. Uh, the Minnesota's 50 hot feet high, you know. So Van Brunt looks down and says, What are you? And Worden says, I'm the monitor. I'm here to save you. Van Brunt looks down in disbelief. Well, I don't know what you're going to do tomorrow, but I'll fight my ship and I'll sink before surrender. And word and merely said, I will protect you, sir. Well, as you can see, the battle, the Virginia starts to move towards the Minnesota. The Minnesota, of course, is protected by the monitor. And for the, this is, Battle begins about 8.30 with a shell from a seven-inch brook gun screaming through the rigging of the Minnesota. The second shot actually sets a fire on the Minnesota. And then the monitor boldly challenges. Remember, the monitor is 171 feet in length. 
the Virginia is 262 feet, nine inches. So it's a pygmy uh, versus a Goliath, uh, right? And the Virginia goes five knots. Um, it's got cantankerous engines. The monitor goes seven knots with its smaller draft, 11 feet versus 22 feet of the Virginia. Um, you know, she has certain quickness and advantages. But so what's going to happen, as you see from this map, we're going to see a concentric circles happening. The monitor keep trying to block the Virginia from striking the Minnesota. And so this goes on uh, for about an hour and a half where the monitor has to break off action so it can reload the shells in the turret. Now, this is uh, a model made by my friend and uh, uh, just for me to use today, right? Now, this is actually after the Battle of the Ironclads, and you can tell that from the plating around the pilot house. So the pilot house is a little box up here. So revolving turret. Uh, this is also an improvement done at the Washington Navy Yard in uh, uh, November of 1862. But this is basically what this little ship looks like. Now, if I'm on the Virginia, the Merrimack, I look at that and go, that's nothing. Uh, the trouble is it's iron plate, eight inches of iron plate on its turret means it's pretty safe. In fact, when the first shots rattle the turret of the monitor, everyone ducks. They all go, wow, it works. <laughs> you know, and you can just imagine. I mean, this is an experimental vessel. No one knows, is it going to work? No one knows that it's going to float. In fact, it really didn't float well. And so it's fighting in these concentric circles and the monitor breaks off action to go reload ammunition. Catesby App Roger Jones, who has replaced uh, Franklin Buchanan as commander of the Virginia, will take his chance to go against the Minnesota. However, the ship runs aground and those engines are straining to pull it off the mud bank. The monitor comes up, fires away at the Virginia. Now, there's a big problem with the monitor. You can't really see out of it. Okay. Up at the bow, we have the turret house, I mean, the pilot house. So there was a speaking system that you could send messages back to the turret says, fire at five points starboard. Well, that makes sense, you know, the trouble is they had white marks below the turret to show where to stop and you use black powder, right? And that they get covered up. Uh, then you're in a vessel that's doing this circular move and the turret is moving. So you don't know where you are. In fact, if you want to look out to see if you're in the turret itself, you can look over the guns like that. You see a gray object, you want to shoot. The trouble is the guns are at a level. As you can see, there's the pilot house. There's the smokestack. It's called monitor roulette, okay? <laughs> And so uh, the big thing is, is that uh, uh, the Virginia runs aground, the monitor fires at it, but they don't know what they're firing at. In fact, many crew members of the Virginia all say, hey, if they shot our hull, we would have been a goner. But they didn't. They can't see. So consequently, um, they will, uh, uh, the, mon the Virginia We'll finally get enough power. They throw cotton waste, turpentine soaked rags, and they put enough power so the Virginia gets off the mud bank. Well, seeing this, Catesby Jones decides that he's going to try and ram the monitor. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, he's already sank, the ship has already sank one vessel. Why not the monitor? So he builds up speed to head towards the monitor, word and sees it coming, and he tells his men, look out, right? And so actually Peter Williams, the quartermaster, the guy at the wheel, will turn the vessel just in time. So the Virginia strikes the monitor at a glancing blow. 
And so as a result of that, uh, little damage. In fact, the only damage, you see wood splinters, huge ones from the bow of the Virginia. Remember, the Virginia lost its ram the day before when it sank the Cumberland. So uh, when the Monitor has evasive actions, Jones once again tries to get his ship towards the Minnesota. He can't get closer than a mile because of the shoals. And uh, basically, Worden will look at the Virginia. Woo. Oops, I don't want that. Uh, this is Sammy Dana Green, who's in command in the turret. Uh, this is, of course, the opening scene of the day. Um, and... Uh, um, so you can see that one shot, that's the second shot of the seven inch forward brook gun a hit the Minnesota. There's the dragon off to the right next to the Minnesota. So actually the monitor looks a little big in this picture, I have to tell you. Um, so anyway, Jones decides to um, go after the Minnesota. Word and sees the Virginia riding high, right? Because of all of its gunpowder, its coal, and so you're starting to see the fantail of the Virginia. And so Worden says, I'm going to strike the propeller and I'm going to disable the Virginia. So he gets up speed and he starts rushing towards uh, the monitor, or the monitor starts rushing towards the Virginia. Lo and behold, at the very last moment, there's a steering malfunction in the monitor and it glides past. At that moment, uh, John Taylor Wood, commander of the stern seven inch book gun, will fire a shell that will strike the pilot house, blowing part of it off and Worden's looking out the slit at that very moment. And he is grievously wounded. He falls back away from the pilot house and he says, I'm killed, I am wounded, I'm blinded. And so actually there's about um, 12 people said they went and got word and, and took it. There's not enough room for that to happen. But we do know Peter Williams, uh, Samuel Howard, the pilot, <clears throat> and uh, Wilhelm Durst will help. Uh, yeah, Will, Wilhelm's everywhere. Uh, <laughs> Wilhelm actually uh, will say in his story that he was there when the monitor was sinking, right? And he does a great story about how cold he got and how much he needed grog when he got to the Rhode Island. Well, he wasn't there, you know, And but uh, as... He would later admit, well, most of everyone who was there is dead now, so I can say what I want. And uh, uh, he doesn't die till 1916. Uh, so uh, nevertheless, um, as the monitor is struck, Peter Williams sh pulls the vessel off away onto a, 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 a shoal. And the Virginia then thinks about attacking the Minnesota. And uh, the big thing is, is that the Minnesota, um, <clears throat> the tide is going out. So Jones, who walks down the gun deck talking to all the officers, they all agree, well, let's go back to Norfolk. Let's get repaired. And then we'll be able to strike the enemy's vessel. Uh, and so they turn to head to the Elizabeth River. This is a half hour. By this time, um, Samuel Dana Green has come down from the turret into uh, Worden's cabin. He's a ghastly sight. And uh, uh, basically, um, he will, uh, uh, jo uh, Green says, what do you want me to do? <laughs> you know, I'm blinded, I'm dying. Um, you must do what you think is best to do. Save the Minnesota if you can. And that's exactly what Green does. He does not go after the uh, Virginia. And consequently, the Battle of Hampton Roads is basically over by 1230. I mean, the Confederates think during the battle of several ways to try and strike at the monitor. One of my favorite ways is that John Taylor Wood goes to KHB Jones and says, hey, I got an idea. Get us close to that thing 
and we'll jump on board. I got a bunch of volunteers. We'll take our pea coats. We'll put them over the pilot house, stick them down the funnels and the blowers. And then we got chloroform and we'll throw it in the grated turret. Remember they got the plans and, and we'll take her by boarding. Jones goes, yes, yeah, sure. Um, uh, they never try that, but, uh, um, word and will later comment after, and he does survive the battle, as we all know. Uh, he will uh, serve with distinction, later ending up as a rear admiral. This picture shows Worden with the sword given to him by the state of New York, made by, or put together by Tiffany's of New York. So it's a pretty fancy thing. So the big thing is, is the Battle of Ironclads changes naval warfare forever. No more are we going to see wooden ships, although the U.S. Navy still builds them. They shouldn't be. It's a waste of money because it's ironclads that rule the waves. This revolution in naval warfare occurs in Hampton Roads. I you know, uh, two centuries ago or something. I can't do math, uh, but uh, I have to tell you, it shocked navies throughout the world. And actually the monitor design was considered the little ship that saved the nation. It was a bad design. And uh, you'll learn if you watch some more of my, read my blogs or programs here at the marinersmuseum.org. You'll learn all about what makes a monitor not the ship that should have been invested in like it was. It had so many problems. And yet, at that moment, on March 9th, 1862, it stopped the rampaging Confederate ironclad from destroying the rest of the Union wooden fleet and forever we considered the little ship that saved the nation. Thank you.